Let, see. Let us start now, since this conference has been running on schedule, uh, to Monfred's amazement, I know. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone <laughs> to this session, which is Labor Rights as Human Rights, Applicability to Autonomous Work. Um, this session stems from work that all the presenters uh, did uh, over the past few years on a book called Labor, Business, and Human Rights Law. And the book itself was, in a sense, inspired by a comment of Virginia Leary's, where she said that labor law and human rights law were that proceeded on parallel tracks that rarely or ever crossed, which is in one way strange because individuals have human rights 24 seven and you would think then that their human rights would be protected when they're at work. So this led to an inquiry uh, about how, well, let me step back at another thing. From the human rights law viewpoint, governments have the responsibility to respect and protect human rights and remedy violations. So if you take that concept in mind, you say government then should be protecting the human rights of people when they work. So I, I look at that because sometimes when we talk about labor law protecting people, some, not in our field, but something it only means you protect the weak instead of this idea that you protect everyone who has people who have rights. So we look into this concept of what were the rights being protected, how were they viewed in different countries, et cetera. And, and that's how the book got started. So for today's session, we uh, will consider something that was, I think, inherent in what we did, but not explicit, was um, how it applies to autonomous work, which will then get back to this issue of whether there are any gaps or are there gaps in the way governments are protecting the human rights of people when they work. So having said that, and uh, I should have said this at the very beginning for one second, thanking the team in Modena uh, for bringing us together this year and for continuing uh, the work of Marco Biagi, who some of us on this session today remember fondly. And Marco firmly believed in bringing people together, particularly people from different countries, to learn from each other. Uh, in our comparative labor law sense, and also to encourage the work of younger scholars. So thank you uh, for doing this, uh, even though it is virtual. Let me turn it over now to uh, my co-editor, Beryl Tahar, uh, now in Poland and formerly at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Beryl. Where is she? Beryl, thank you. you microphone. Um, I was still talking with Nikita, apparently he has troubles connecting so I hope maybe someone of the organization can contact him okay. and not seeing Philippe here I suspect he might have the same problems so I hope maybe someone okay. from the organization can reach out to the two of them uh, what I understood is that the link that you sent Janice is not working for them so okay. they clicked on the link. Um, but thank you uh, for the introduction and introducing me. I'm indeed in Russia and uh, I was enjoying some snowstorm this afternoon while cycling. Ah, good, the two of them in there. Um, and I'm experiencing a whole new world, but um, well, even though it's in COVID-19 times, I'm uh, pretty happy here. Um, so uh, the presentation is partly based on uh, the chapter that I wrote together with Attila Kuhn uh, for the book. And it's a bit of a stretch to bring it uh, to the topic of the autonomous worker. Um, but hopefully you will bear with me and I will take you step by step through the issue. Um, and I think I see something interesting, but well, would, I'm looking forward to hear your ideas about this. Um, so Attila and I wrote about uh, the CSR policies of the European Union in a bit of a global perspective. And in the chapter, chapter we traced the EU's activities and approaches in the field of CSR. 
And I think for many labor lawyers, these are not so visible, partly because they are uh, of soft law. Um, and second, uh, most of these activities are not per se, definitely not on uh, based on social policy, um, Title 10 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So it happens a bit under the radar of us uh, labor lawyers. What we did uh, find is that uh, basically the EU is not very much a leader in the field of CSR. It seems to be more kind of a follower from what the OECD and the United Nations are doing, which might be kind of typical or striking because most of the 100 companies scoring really high on CSR are actually European companies or EU-based companies. However, that what the EU is doing is rather unique, um, especially because uh, the few activities that, that the EU did undertake in the field of CSR uh, are legally binding. And that is still a rarity when we are talking about CSR. So the first of these activities is the Directive on Transparent Non-Financial Reporting, which requires big companies to annually report about issues such as the environment, human rights, and labor rights, so that uh, hardcore CSR topics. Um, and it is legally binding because it is in a directive, so member states need to implement it in national legislation, etc. So the second initiative of the EU is the Procurement Directive, which makes CSR issues, among, among which is also social rights, part of any procurement done by the member states. Um, and at the moment, which isn't included in the chapter, because at that time it wasn't discussed yet, but at the moment the EU is also discussing a directive or mandatory, uh, a regulation on mandatory, mandatory human rights due diligence. Um, what it exactly will be, that is still, uh, we still need to see, uh, because it is discussed, but um, it might become another uh, unique piece of legally binding CSR legislation. Another thing that we considered in our chapter is CSR initiatives in EU member states. Here too we found a number of rather uh, interesting initiatives that are in fact legally binding for companies. Uh, for example, in 2016 the UK adopted the Mo uh, Modern Slavery Act, which is largely based on, uh, on due diligence. In 2017, France adopted the law on due vigilance, and in 2015-16, more or less, the Netherlands started to work on sectoral responsible business conduct uh, governance, which are co-signed uh, by the state, um, and also all built on, on this idea of due diligence. So what we can get from this is that the EU um, and a number of its member states are rather active in developing forms of mandatory due diligence. And um, from here, I want to make the step to these autonomous workers. And I want to address two issues. The first one is personal scope of CSR. And the second, the engagement as part of due diligence. And I will just do it briefly because 10 minutes are over before we know it. So the first one on the personal scope of CSR. CSR instruments don't say anything about it. Most of the time it's about workers without any further specification. Um, and the same actually applies to the employer. It's about the company and the business activities, not making much distinction of what kind of employer the company is. And here I'm referring to the research that also tries to identify who is the employer when we're talking about this platform and uh, kick worker situations. So if a personal scope could be found in CSR, it is actually per topic of labor law. Um, to be more concrete, labor law in CSR is mostly about the ILO score labor standards. So topics as forced labor, child labor, equal treatment, and trade union rights, sometimes also occupational health and safety, uh, and minimum wage. When explicit reference is made to the ILO's conventions, then we could distract the personal scope of that respective convention. However, often we see only a reference made to, uh, to it either indirectly or only to the ILO's 1998 declaration 
on, uh, on fundamental principles and rights at work. Um, and this is first of all about monitoring reporting by the ILO of countries that have not ratified the core conventions. And secondly, it's also about the principles concerning the fundamental rights, which are the subject of those core uh, conventions. So it's not about the exact rights and obligations of those conventions. Um, so that makes me wonder whether we can apply the definitions of, the uh, of these conventions one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, to these uh, CSR initiatives. Uh, I think that's a bit tricky. Uh, so that leaves the personal scope of CSR uh, from a legal point of view, uh, to say the least, very vague and ambiguous. Um, from a general understanding and I think intention point of view, I think most people will say that it only applies to those workers with an employment contract. Um, but the essence for now is that it, it is just fake if we look at these initiatives. The other point that I wanted to address here is, uh, is actually due diligence and then also linked to engagement. Uh, and then a due diligence uh, as a form of risk management, how it is defined by the OECD. Because that seems to be kind of the, the leading direction uh, in, in CSR and being picked up most by all kinds of organizations. And they understand um, due diligence as a form of risk management to prevent or mitigate adverse, eff uh, adverse effects of a business activity on human rights and with that also labor rights. When risks on adverse impacts are um, inventoried, the company can does not just walk away. Instead, it is supposed to stay, to stay to make uh, maintenance and to make sure it doesn't happen again. In this context, business, businesses are held accountable, or at least responsible, for the adverse impact of their activities and what their activities have on human rights. And as Professor Balaji um, Dennis always explains, human rights do not stop uh, to exist when you enter the premises of the company. They stick to you as a human being, right? One could argue in this context that due diligence and engagements, which are about business activities and human rights, do not care very much about any definition of worker, employee, self-employed or whatever. Because again, it's about preventing or mitigating adverse impacts on human rights. So to come to a conclusion, uh, against the general unfounded presumption and understanding of CSR, it could be argued that due to the aim and form of CSR, namely um, uh, general unfounded presumption of understanding of ESR, it could be argued that CSR is only about workers being employees with an employment contract. But if you look at the aim and the form of CSR, namely filled in by due diligence and engagement to prevent or mitigate adverse impacts of business and human rights, CSR is in fact a sort of ignorance of any personal scope in the sense of work status. And this could be different uh, when direct uh, references are made to the ILO conventions, in which case the personal scope might be set per topic and um, what did that means for autonomous workers depends on the definition thereof uh, that applies within the ILO and if I'm not mistaken I think Valerio de Stefano wrote a nice report about this uh, the definition of worker in the ILO so we could get information from there and a last thought to share with you with the EU developing its uh, uh, own mandatory human rights due diligence it will be interesting to see what definition of worker it will apply either none at all uh, following CSR in general use the union uh, definition the, the uh, community definition or whatever applies within the member states so these uh, are kind of the flavors that the EU always tends to use and for each choice, a lot can be said, uh, but now it could be just an interest. Uh, so for this, so this moment could actually be interesting and a good time to start the discussion on it, because now we might still be able to influence uh, that choice. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Beryl. That was exactly on time. It's amazing. And uh, you left us, as you said, with a with a point that I'm sure we'll take up in the discussion and the questions. Uh, 
about that. Uh, let me turn it now to Eduardo Alice uh, from Italy. Eduardo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, yes, I, I was among the contributors to the to the book. It was a very nice and challenging experience uh, for for me as a lawyer coming from the Italian legal environment. The human rights discourse uh, in the labor field uh, is not that usual to be addressed. Uh, this is uh, the reason is that uh, Italy has developed uh, since the Constitution, 19, 1948 Constitution, uh, a huge uh, set of workers' rights. So, in fact, the protection of workers has been guaranteed uh, through specific measures and through specific entitlements. So that the need to highlight the human rights perspective in the uh, in the work relationship was not there. Um, however, uh, as uh, usually happens when the the level of protection guaranteed by labor law is lowered down and then of course uh, scholars but also judges they look for other uh, source of law where uh, protection can be found so uh, this is an, in, in a way a negative indicator of the, the state of health of labor law when uh, human rights can come into the uh, into the stage at least from our perspective as a country with a very strong protection of workers' rights. However, um, the idea, the basic idea of the chapter was to highlight the fact that uh, there are uh, some basic constitutional rights uh, in the Italian legal environment uh, which can uh, trace back to the very idea of human rights. And this is, of course, first of all, the, the right to work, which has to be recognized as a human right as such. And it is recognized as such by the Italian Constitution, um, notwithstanding the fact there is no specific reference to human rights, and the right to social security. Uh, this is a, a point on which I will come back later because I, I think uh, it's it's an interesting point. But starting from the right to work, what is uh, provided by the Italian Constitution is that this is a, a citizenship right, but not in the sense of nationality. It's a is a right of, a, of any human being uh, in Italy, uh, and is a right to work in the sense that the, the, the republic, so the, the, the public authorities, they have to facilitate the access to any uh, freely uh, chosen uh, activity. Uh, this is the first point, but the second point is this: there is also a duty to work, in the sense the a duty to contribute to the material and spiritual progress of society. And this has to be connected with Article 35 of the Constitution, in which work, labor is protective, protected and supported in any form and kind. So the, the, the idea in the Constitution is never that one of the, the protection of the employee as such, or only of the employee, it's the interpretation, the scholarly interpretation and the legislation enacted after the constitution that is focused on uh, employment and on employees uh, and so it's not difficult to it's this is not difficult to understand of course on the one hand from the other hand uh, we have to highlight that recently uh, well uh, since more or less 30 years we are uh, start thinking about the right to work also in the perspective of the self-employed. So uh, the idea that uh, not only the job seeker as employee has to be supported, but also people uh, seeking for an opportunity of self-employment and even the so-called self-entrepreneurship. So the fact that all kind of 
work or activity, uh, even the freedom to conduct a business has to be supported in the framework of the right to work as a human right. And this is my first point. The second point refers to uh, social security. Uh, we all know that social security is a human right. It's a human right recognized by the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, it's been uh, so protected by different UN documents and conventions. And this is also the approach of the ILO to social security. I recently uh, focused on this on this point. And what is interesting in the ILO uh, uh, 102 Convention of 1952, the Social Security Minimum Standards Convention, is there is that there uh, the member states they have a choice as far as the uh, personal scope of application of their social security system is concerned. They can choose uh, a part of the employees, they can choose a part of the residents, but they also can choose a part of the economically active population. Which means by difference that not only employees may be covered by a social security system, which is a human rights such as social security, but also econo other economically active uh, people, which means, in my view, of course, first of all, self-employed. So th this is a very interesting idea because, uh, as we heard yesterday during the conference, uh, usually social security system they have focused on employees. That was the traditional uh, target, but uh, the um, changes in these last decades. Uh, show us that social security system, they shall also take into account self-employed. And the, the point is, of course, the justification of this extension of the personal scope of application. Uh, because one could say, well, self-employed, they also can be self-protected by their uh, economic possibilities and so on. But what we are seeing now is they are they have difficulties in not only from an economic but also from a social point of view so the ground the ground of protection of social security protect, protection of self employed could be found in the fact that social security is human rights and as such has to be guaranteed to any human being uh, and to any economically active human being of course obviously also to inactive or non-active, but our focus is today on self-employed. So I, I think that the ILO uh, instruments, the ILO conventions may be used as an important tool in order to um, widen the scope of application of social security systems. Uh, maybe this is not the case with the, the, the label instruments. This is a very, a difficult discussion, but I think that we could start from social security as a virtuous example on how the international labor standards uh, could be applied in the perspective of uh, human rights. I will stop here, so I uh, will give some space to, to the debate also. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Everybody is sticking very much to time. So uh, that's very good. So it'll give Monfred plenty of time to discuss. Uh, I believe Philippe Dursmont is now joined. That's what I was told. Is Philippe connected? Is anybody? I I'm here. Philippe from Belgium, yes. Thank you. Philippe Dursmont from uh, Leva in Belgium. Um, and I know you have a PowerPoint if you'd like to use it, right? I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just going to talk. Great, fine. Because uh, Manfred doesn't like uh, PowerPoints. I, I regret <laughs> that uh, I am not sitting there in Modena on a terrace uh, drinking even Lambrusco or even uh, Aceto Balsamico. Uh, it would be a pleasure. Um, I have also contributed to the book Concerned with a chapter on the European Convention on Human Rights as a fountain of labor rights. 
What I like is the expression labor rights, which also has been used uh, for this workshop. Um, and I wondered uh, why I, I like it because it's very broad. It allows you to uh, do justice to workers' rights, but also, let's never forget them, to employers' rights. And it also allows you to integrate human rights at work, because I want you to uh, leave this uh, Cold War divide between uh, economic, uh, social, cultural rights and civil and political rights. I think it's not helpful at all. Even if we would look to the European Convention on Human Rights, it never states that it is about civil and political rights. Uh, it's only in the European Social Charter, remember, that it is stated that the rights in the European Convention and human rights uh, are civil and political rights. But that's not what the European Convention says itself. And we have even a very nice uh, judgment, Airy versus Ireland, where the court says very clearly that it's perfectly possible to extend these human rights enshrined into an economic and social sphere. So involving them in the employment relation. And this very nice judgment of 1979 did not provoke seismic changes, not a revolution. Uh, labor lawyers were not very hopeful about the European Convention until probably the beginning of this century. And it's clear why, because, well, the court in Strasbourg was promoting the negative freedom of association, fine, but not very helpful. Uh, and it, it never really found a condemnation of or a violation of forced labor until 2005. But with Demir and Baikara, there was a shift. There was a shift, and this was due to the intertextual interpretation, okay? Uh, trying to interpret the convention in the light of other instruments, taking seriously the supervisory body's case law of these other instruments. And this provides a prospect for a lot of relevant rights such as the forced, the forced labor uh, prohibition. This is, of course, shows how important the European Convention is, because there you have the word labor, and it's much more fleshed out than in other instruments on economic, uh, social, and cultural rights. And obviously, Article 11, the freedom of uh, association, right to organize, mentioning specifically trade unions, but all the other rights, human rights at work, can be relevant. But we should also be careful because the court also has introduced some thresholds which might prevent workers to enjoy these human rights fully. And that is first the employment relation because the court recognized that the employment relation is a restriction in say at per se uh, of uh, human rights. I say a restriction, not a, a total uh, exemption. And they also had to deal with uh, clauses in individual employment contracts wavering human rights. But in this field, the court has gradually developed a very progressive, very uh, severe stance and is very skeptical about these uh, wavering clauses. The mere fact that a person can obviously always regain his status of freedom by exiting, by terminating the employment contract is an argument which is not at all uh, satisfying for the court anymore. However, the court is to some extent um, considering uh, in a number of, of mainly German cases, the uh, nature of the firm uh, by also granting the freedom of religion to the community and to the employer representing that community and in this way, the freedom of religion, in fact, can be used against uh, employees in uh, these tendenzbetriebe. And even this is paradoxically, the freedom of association has been mobilized in connection with the freedom of religion in this dreadful case, Syndicatul Pastoral Celbun, where uh, indeed um, priests were not allowed and, and other people to to institute a, a trade union 
against the bishop because this would be contrary to the freedom of religion which is not uh, in the rules of the Romanian Orthodox Church um, enshrine the existence of, of trade unions, a, a very problematic judgment in my view. In my paper, I've also tried to, to see whether the court recognizes some legal laws as the kind of law uh, which uh, can restrict um, human rights. Human rights can be restricted provided that they are prescribed by, by law. And among this law, you find sources of labor law, like obviously the contract of employment, collective agreements. Uh, what I didn't find, and I'm happy about that, is unwritten rules, unwritten rules invented by employers or uh, habits uh, of employers. And this is important because in the famous debate about the Ashvita judgment of the Court of Justice, the Court of Justice accepts, in a way, unwritten rules, policies, which can indeed be mobilized to justify indirect discrimination. And I think that this approach is extremely problematic because we don't like unwritten rules, policies, restricting human rights at work. Now, what is the added value of the European Convention on Human Rights? Well, in general, and then for the uh, autonomous workers, I think the added value is that the court has teeth. So even where there is an overlap with economic, social and cultural law instruments, uh, there is a judicial supervision within the Council of Europe, of European Convention on Human Rights. And to some extent, the court has taken a more progressive stance. For example, uh, there is no reason to say that the right to collective action can be restricted on the basis of collective agreements without any further conditionality, although the European Social Charter allows it. This is not true under the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and obviously, there is uh, some leeway under the European Convention on Human Rights for um, restrictions uh, uh, so affecting the armed forces in enjoying uh, the freedom of association, uh, but there is no scope for blanket prohibitions, as is the case apparently under the European Social Charter. Um, I think that um, for the um, autonomous workers, I think um, Article 11 is helpful because first, there is the freedom of association. And, and there the question whether you are a worker or not is, is not material. But even if you believe in the, and I do, in the added value of the right to organize, Liberté Syndicale within Article 11, because it gives you additional rights, I think that the court has made a first step towards a progressive in interpretation of the notion of the worker linked to the trade union in this uh, although dreadful uh, judgment, Syndicatul Pastoral Chelbun, because it does not require an employment contract. The employment relation should not be based upon an employment contract in order to enjoy the specific right to organize. Uh, but it does still insist on the notion of subordination, which, and there was plenty of subordination in the Roman Orthodox Church, uh, that, and, and that might be a problem. There is, of course, one case, uh, I think it's called Vratce Liceshniki Syndicat, or known also as the Croatian case, where the, it was about a strike of uh, doctors, okay, in a hospital, and it's pretty possible that among these doctors there were self-employed people and this could be of course uh, used although the case is not so clear uh, as a, a starting point for a right to take collective action for even self-employed uh, people and i think that uh, indeed the uh, european convention on human rights last but not least is useful for all the other human rights which are not at all linked to any worker status at all, uh, freedom of expression, uh, right to privacy, freedom of religion uh, should be fully used in any kind of contractual relation 
uh, whether it is uh, of uh, employed people or self-employed people or whatever kind of people in a contractual relation. I leave it up here. Is that okay, Janice? Well, yes, definitely. Thank you, Philippe. And uh, we turn now at last to Nikita Lyuta uh, from Moscow, and I hope his connection is working. Nikita, are you there? Oh, yes, I am here. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Great. Hello. Hello, Eduardo, Manfred, Philippe. Nice seeing you. Uh, do you see me? Because, uh, I, okay. Yeah, please uh, see you. Yeah. So I will not waste time. Uh, first of all, uh, I must say uh, that well, I will follow Philippe's example. I will refrain from using PowerPoint because of Manfred's presence here, which is obvious. Uh, will respect <laughs> this. And uh, another disclaimer is that uh, I'm supposed to talk mostly about the chapter uh, in the book, but uh, our life in Russia is uh, very, I would say, quick, uh, to say it diplomatically. And many things change uh, even after uh, uh, publishing this book, uh, which is the recent event. And after the publication of our chapter with Yelena Gerasima, which was ded dedicated to the balance of uh, the- Can you speak economy, a bit louder? Uh, I will. Uh, do you hear me better now? Do you hear me? Yes, when you're closer to the uh, laptop, yeah. probably you hear it better. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, um, what we have now, uh, after the publication of this book, uh, again, our chapter was dedicated to the balance of rights uh, between the employees and employees. Uh, we had, uh, well, what can I say? Uh, the notorious uh, amendment to the constitution of uh, the summer of 2020, uh, probably some of you have heard about this event because it, uh, its importance went uh, far beyond uh, the issues of not even labor law itself because it's the amendments about uh, which can be said called eternal Putin amendments uh, to the constitution. And uh, there were many sweeteners, kind of political sweeteners, uh, offered uh, to the new version uh, of Constitution. And some of them were dealing with uh, labor and social rights. One of uh, the closest uh, amendments to the Constitution was uh, the notion of the respect to the human dignity and the special reference to uh, it kind of uh, repeats the, chap the name of our chapter, the balance of rights uh, of, um, and obligation of the citizens. And uh, other one more practically sound is the link. We did have uh, the provision in our constitution which was dedicated to the minimum wage, but it was very vague uh, because it was dealing with uh, the reference to the federal law, it was stating that uh, the minimum wage is supposed to be set up by the federal law. But now it also contains a statement that um, the minimum wage is not only established by the federal law, but it may not be uh, lower than the survival minimum. And uh, it was kind of advertised as a huge social achievement, something new in the legal system, uh, among other political and PR campaign uh, for the, the voting for this amendment to the constitution. If we would look uh, to the text of our labor code, uh, we would see that uh, we have uh, the same, literally same provision in our labor code since 2002. So it already exists. But uh, it was the only notion of the labor code, only article of the labor code, which was written in the code, but in the last uh, article of the labor code, there was an explanation that this part of um, this article one to three of the labor code, which established that the minimum wage shouldn't be below this survival minimum, 
is to be introduced by the se uh, separate federal law, which didn't exist for about 18 years. So close to um, the adoption of the uh, new constitutional amendments, uh, uh, the new federal law was adopted, so this uh, statement of the labor code uh, uh, stopped being just a declaration, but came into the reality. Uh, for me, uh, this constitutional amendment is, uh, it would be better not to have it, uh, even outside of the political discourse and uh, the political price which we have to pay for all this mass wilderness. I think even if uh, this amendment would be uh, offered uh, as it is without any other bad parts uh, in the Constitution, this very notion uh, of the minimum wage to the survival minimum is a kind of tricky thing because uh, uh, I'm sure everyone here knows uh, the international standards about this, the notion of the European Social Charter and uh, the uh, United Nations Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights of 1966, which deal with uh, the decent uh, level uh, of our living and the explanation of the European Community on Social Rights, which uh, connects the minimum wages not to something abstract, but to 60% of uh, medium wage in the country. In our case, this uh, minimum survival minimum uh, level is uh, linked to uh, what is called the minimum uh, consumption basket basket, which is calculated by the government. And the problem is not only the amount of this basket, which is uh, actually below the survival level. It is currently 12,000 uh, rubles, rubles, which is like uh, 160 euros some per month. Uh, so it is below any survival. For example, if you take uh, Moscow or the, even in the poor regions, it, it is quite below. But the bigger problem here is not the level itself, but the possibility of the government to say that there is no sufficient money for um, our bigger uh, basket because it is calculated by the government. When we look uh, to this European uh, benchmark it is uh, compared to the objective economic uh, parameter which is uh, the medium wage and the government here is not interested into uh, hiding this uh, medium wage because uh, otherwise well, it, it would be politically unacceptable but in our case well, now it is established in the constitution and i think it is just the wrong parameter to look at uh, how many minutes do I have more? It depends on. Uh, about one to two. One to two. Then, well, I wanted to talk about the new chapter on the remote work uh, from the point of view of the autonomous, autonomous character of uh, work. We have a totally new chapter on remote work, but probably if the questions be dealing with this. And also, we have. Uh, interesting cases regarding the platform work because uh, the intensity of work during the COVID time, the intensity of work of taxi drivers and delivery workers, all of whom now work uh, through on online platform has grown uh, enormously. So uh, we have interesting things and uh, new things happening with this, but probably during the discussion. So, this time stopping. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. Uh, uh, let me turn it now to Manfred for a uh, discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Janice. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I start with uh, Beryl's uh, paper, and uh, she talks about uh, CSR. Uh, in the European context. And of course, it's good. And I fully agree with her that 
there we have the focus on the multi-stakeholder company. This is always better than having the focus on the shareholder company. Uh, but we should not overestimate the uh, European approach on CSR. You see, in my view, it's very much overestimated. The real core element of all this so far is the voluntary approach. This voluntarism fitted very well in the neoliberal policy of the Lisbon strategy and of Europe 2020. And all attempts of binding regulation, as for example, the TCA frame framework, were rejected by the employers and had no chance of, come, of coming through. And you see, Beryl talked about what is now envisaged for the global uh, supply chains. And she referred to these very nice laws we have in Netherlands, in France, and we had we have in the UK, which no longer is a part of the EU, but this doesn't matter. But the real problem is that, by the way, we also might get such a law soon here in Germany, a big debate. But as always, there is enormous resistance by the employers. And I think the real lesson we get when we look outside, as you all know, there is an initiative by the United Nations Human Rights Council. And that initiative started in 2016 when Ecuador and South Africa asked for a resolution to get an international binding instrument. Because everybody knows it's no use to have national laws, because this, of course, uh, leads only to distortion of competition, and the companies of that country might go elsewhere. Therefore, everybody knows we need an in international uh, uh, scheme. Of course, we have these these different. Uh, 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 national action plans and so on, but they're all voluntary. Therefore, Ecuador and South Africa asked for a binding instrument. The resolution came through, by the way, against all the industrialized countries who profit of the situation we have now, including all the EU countries, you know, they were against it. But nevertheless, the resolution came through and now have a working group working for such a binding uh, instrument. And what happens? They presented a wonderful draft of an internationally binding instrument in 2019. Well, what happens then? Enormous resistance by the industrialized countries. And of course, if I see this, I do not have much hope for the new initiative of the, of the European Union. In other words, what do I want to say? I want to say that if we want real decent structures within the companies, the multinational companies in particular, then we do not need voluntary structures because we have found out these voluntary structures did not change things at all. There is enormous, as you know, certification industry, which is monitoring these kind of uh, CSR things. And then you get a social label. And this, of course, only means that you have something 
for your marketing department. You know, it's mainly all the CSR structure, in my view, is a sort of ally by helping only to the market strategies of the multinationals. Therefore, and uh, I'm wondering what Beryl will say, what we need, but this will be very difficult, we need binding instruments. Well, this leads me, so I, I changed a little bit the pattern, this leads me to Nikita. Nikita, in your uh, chapter in the book, not tonight, but I, I don't want to drop it. You also talk about the enormous resistance of the employers in your country and the resistance against any sort of regulation. And thereby, he destroys the widespread wrong assumption that labor law in Russia would be an obstacle to economic development. This is nonsense. And he also shows that the methods of comparative rating are more or less leading to wrong conclusions. He makes, and this I find very interesting, he makes the test whether in Russia labor law is too rigid to allow a fair balance between employers' freedoms and workers' rights. He convincingly can show that there is not only much flexibility, but there is a shift in the power relationship in the employer's favor. This is mainly due to the weakness of the trade unions and to the further weaken, weakening of them by legislation and by the courts. This, in my view, is a very, very important assessment because it shows that a mere focus on individual rights, and it is mostly done in the ranking attempts, is not very helpful at all. And this, of course, also applies to what he just said to the regulation on minimum wage. You know, if you only look at that, you know, it doesn't tell you very much on the real structures and on the power relationships. So far to perhaps to uh, you, uh, Nikita. Now I come to Eduardo. Well, <laughs> I was very interested when Eduardo discussed the right to work as a foundational constitutional value in the Italian system. And of course, he shows us this is not only for employees in a strict sense, but it goes further. Well, and he illustrates it by presenting the example of protection against dismissal. And this leads me to, to the following. In Germany, you could do the same analysis and you would end up with the same result. But the basis would be totally different. Whereas you in Italy do have in the text of your con constitution the right to work. In Germany, we don't have such a thing. In Germany, we don't have the social rights in the constitution. We only have uh, an article which says that everybody has the right freely to choose their occupation or profession, their place of work and the place of training. But we do have a constitutional court. And this court doesn't care for the fact that we do not have social rights in the constitution. He simply interprets the social rights into the constitution by starting at such a text, which I read for you, and then coming to the same result as we have in Italy. This, I think, is from a methodological point of view, very interesting. 
Whereas in, in Italy, it is the constitution. With us, it's the constitutional court much more. Well, there's another aspect which I would like to, uh, to highlight. I agree with, 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 with uh, uh, Eduardo, uh, and he is fully correct, that of course, such a right of work does not entail a job seeker's right to get a job and a right to maintain a job by all means. This is not possible in a free society. But we have in Germany, not in West Germany, but in the former Democratic Republic of Germany, an example that it can be different. In the German Democratic Republic, in East Germany, I might say, they had in the labor code a right to work understood as an entitlement to get a job and to maintain the job by all means. And if you ask me, this was, this was the main reason that the Eastern Germany economically collapsed. It doesn't work, you know, if you have such a right. Therefore, we in Germany, but this of course uh, is also something very ridiculous. Now, formerly in West Germany and now in the unified Germany, we have a constitutional obligation to full employment. Well, this is to be understood as a constitutional goal obliging the government that its policies promote full employment. But since nobody knows, how do you promote full employment? And even the economists, you know, don't agree on how you should do it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just symbolic, if you ask me. Now let me finally come to Philip. Well, the main message, and I like this message, uh, Philip gives us is that the European Court on Human Rights treats the European Convention on Human Rights as a living instrument. It is very dynamic. And they shows us uh, this uh, development by looking at uh, uh, the question, who is a worker in the sense of the Court on Human Rights? And this is not only for persons who are bound by a contract of employment, but it goes much more, much further uh, to human beings offering their labor on the labor market. The contract of employment in this context is more or less irrelevant. Uh, he has a much more generic category of worker. Uh, and this, of course, uh, 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 is in line with the human rights at work. What I think is very important, and you mentioned it uh, uh, again today, uh, Eduardo, uh, not Eduardo, Philippe, sorry, uh, that the court has overcome the divide between civil and political rights on the one side and social rights and economic rights and cultural rights on the other side. This, I think, is extremely important and it shows the development because let's let's be honest in, in the, the beginning, beginning the european convention on human rights was understood to not include the fundamental social rights because it was from the very beginning planned that there would be another convention that convention became later on the European Social Charter. But as the Social Charter 
only has a very, as we know, weak monitoring system. Fortunately, the European Court on Human Rights brought in more and more social aspects. And I think the best example is the one which uh, uh, Philip was referring to, Article 11. In Article 11, we nowadays, and there was an enormous turn in the uh, case law of the European Court on Human Rights. Nowadays, we understand freedom of association in the broadest sense including the right to collective bargaining, including the right to strike. And of course, we in Germany, we wait, wait desperately. What will the court do? Because in Germany, as you know, the strike for civil servants is forbidden, not only for specific functions, but forbidden for the whole status as such. And we all hope that the European Court on Human Rights will help us and different from our stupid courts tell us that they also have a right to strike. We shall see. Now, let me come back. Oh, Manfred, let's, this, oh, Manfred, let's, let's try, do I have to stop? Let, 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 me, let me just say the, uh, my last sentence. You know, this kind of dynamic uh, the court has, this evolution, is not liked by all member states. Why is it not liked? Because it restricts the possibilities of the member states, you know. In so far, we have to see that the court on human rights is always in a sort of conflict with the member states, sometimes leading to the fact that the member states do not abide anymore to these kind of uh, judgments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I want to bring up something that Beryl said at the beginning when talking about CSR. Um, and Monfred referred to it. In some ways, the danger with CSR is it allows the company to state its own ideas about uh, what it thinks are the uh, labor rights it should be respect. With regards to this session, it makes me think of something else also, and it relates back to the first session this morning, that if we think of the labor rights as quite narrow in the sense that it only applies to employees, it also allows the company to place workers outside what is traditionally deemed as employment by national courts. And uh, the, in the first sessions, uh, Julia discussed Fed, Fed, FedEx, Federal Express, as having the same type of workers as the other large company, United Parcel Service, but somehow they were no longer employees. And I was wondering, and I'll ask any of the speakers who cares to answer, whether they see their own national courts willing to take a broader view of the coverage of national law or of a constitutional uh, guarantee that applies to workers broader than they used to, because they see this trend that working people are not considered employees anymore. Uh, or are we locked in to these traditional notions and it would require a change in legislation? So I, I don't know if any of the speakers would like to discuss that. If I may. Yeah, Nikita. Uh, well, in our case, uh, we have a few cases uh, also dealing with platform workers. Uh, and uh, these cases are totally negative. And are uh, this deals not, I wouldn't say that the legislation is the bigger problem, probably for us, it's the quality of judges, their qualification, uh, and the quite formal um, approach to the qualification of the employment. Because um, 
we have the position of the Supreme Court, uh, which explains that uh, the court should refer to not only to the definition of the employment uh, relations, which is established by the labor court, but also to the ILO recommendation 198, uh, which um, provides for the uh, definition and uh, different aspects of the employment. And if we would look to the documents of the platform, uh, we have more cases not with parcel services, but with uh, taxi drivers and uh, the delivery workers, you would see that it is employment. It is, uh, if you would, uh, if the qualified qualify judge would make a decision, it is definitely an employment. It is the explanation in this document how the work should be done, the instructions, it's the subordination, and it is quite clear. But the lower level of courts up to now uh, simply refer to the documents, they say that we see the civil law contract, we see uh, our, that it is uh, formulated this way, and that's it. And up to now, I, I think that not the legislation, but the position of courts should be changed, and probably there is a perspective that it would be changed in Russia. If we look, if we compare with the European country and with the US also, by the way, but up to now, we don't have positive examples. Unfortunately. We don't have a, a speaker from Britain, but I would like to mention, uh, tie it in again with something from today. The idea that if a person is entrepreneurial, that somehow they're not a worker to be covered. One could say strictly that every individual is selling his labor, his or her labor, so does not make them an entrepreneur. And I bring into the, uh, you know, the, the uh, Uber, Uber case, from uh, the UK, of course, the Supreme Court just held that uh, they're workers. But what I am referring to is their lower uh, industrial, I think it was the Employment Appeals Tribunal, said something I think was very instructive, but also very hilarious in the way they said it. Um, they were referring to Uber's advocate before the court who tried to say they're entrepreneurs and they can work when they want and, you know, all this. And the, the Employment Appeals Tribunal said, how? Like, how can they grow their business? Work more hours? Drive more? There's no other way. They're individuals uh, essentially being directed and controlled by this company. So yes, they don't have to work, or maybe they could work more hours, but there's no way they can grow a business. And I thought that was a very interesting perspective about what do we mean by a worker versus you know, a, a true entrepreneur. And some courts seem to be, um, I was going to say, being captured uh, by these arguments that these type of workers are entrepreneurs and shouldn't be considered workers. So it's an interesting trend. Did I see Beryl's hand? Did she raise her hand? No, the black, the black, yeah, Beryl, I thought you had your hand up. Or else your cat walked in. <laughs> Yeah, also, he always intervenes. Um, no, it was what you said, like that we workers are, uh, no, that if you were entrepreneurial, you're apparently not a worker. And th that is definitely something that is used in the Netherlands for uh, a case that is quite comparable to the FedEx case that uh, was presented this morning. Um, but also it made me think of the previous session about us as academics. Uh, that we have to become more entrepreneurial as well. But I think many would dispute whether we are employees, yes or no. Uh, but within the employee employment ship, we have to be uh, strong entrepreneurs. So that, that is something that I, I wanted to respond to. If I may, to give a response to uh, Manfred's uh, feedback on, on my presentation. Um, the, uh, when it comes to CSR, I think I see a different function in it rather than setting rights actually for workers. I think it's much more on sort of a discourse play uh, with employers where we slowly keep pushing them into debates, discussions, terminology that they don't like, but more and more do start to go along with. Uh, if, if I look at the things that are being discussed nowadays and compare it with 10 years ago, a lot has changed and we're talking about things that were unimaginable 10 years ago. 
still we are far from where we should be. But I think that without these instruments and without soft law, we wouldn't have these debates at all. And yes, it goes way too slow and it's not the way to go. And uh, for as long as it is not the only way and not the only thing we are trying, I think it has a, a, a solid uh, a value, added value to uh, um, getting the labor law debates in the directions that we wanted to, to go. Uh, maybe I'm still naive in it, but I like to remain this uh, optimist in, uh, in that it could be a way of getting us somewhere. I just think, uh, Beryl, I just think that as long as it is there, it is taken as an excuse for not doing more. That's the big problem. Uh, can I jump in here? Right, because I, I, you know, that I happen to agree. And the excuse is companies say, oh, CSR, we're doing something. We're socially responsible. But about 10, more than 10 years ago, and way before he was director general of the ILO, Guy Ryder wrote a chapter in a book uh, that came out shortly after the UN Global Compact, which some of you may remember. Yeah. And he, he, made a, he made a comment that I really like. And he, he was very annoyed with uh, corp, the way corporate social responsibility was presented. And he said, corporates, basically, he said, corporate social responsibility is not telling us what, their, what corporations think their social responsibility is. It's society telling companies what their social responsibility is. So I think that's uh, the point that has been brought up by some of you today, that it ties back to uh, and I, the, the fact that we could say they're human rights, the 1998 declaration, but, and there's a big but, the 1998 declaration with the four fundamental principles, if they're not linked to conventions, uh, there's a big problem. And if the conventions are interpreted very narrowly instead of broadly, like workers have uh, freedom of association, so who are workers, uh, then the problem comes. And so I think, getting back to something Monfred said about, I think it was Monfred, why there is this re resistance to having a binding instrument, a UN convention on this topic, mm -hmm. uh, is um, because they because uh, companies do not want this broader scope of responsibility uh, to be made explicit and to be made minding. So uh, for those of us who write in the field, I, I think that's the thing that has to be said. There's nothing wrong with CSR if CSR is uh, understood uh, in, in that sense. Uh, I'm looking at the time. So are there any? I mean, I want people to join in. There's always a nature of the Marco Biagi uh, conferences, but but as Philippe would say, we would continue the discussion over the next meal and a glass of wine if we were in mode in a yeah, person. <laughs> are there any questions? Anybody want to make any final comments? Well, if not, I thank uh, all the presenters and, and the discussant, of course for joining in and for all of you in the uh, listening audience, as we say, and, and, and the organizers for doing this. And we'll see you tomorrow uh, for the final day of our conference. Okay. Have a good Thank you everybody. for sharing so wonderfully. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.